Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And welcome to the March talk in SD Forum's Distinguished Speaker Series, co-hosted by the Computer History Museum, the San Francisco Bay Chapter of the ACM, and the Chinese Software Professionals Association. And this evening, we're delighted also to have as a co-host for this event um, the Alumni Association of the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. I'm Sanford Rockowitz, co-chair of the series. SD Forum, as many of you know, is an organization of nearly 2,000 software professionals. And our aim, simply put, is to keep all of you in touch and up to date on what all aspects of the software industry. To this end, we have some 20 to 30 events each month, focusing on both the business and the technology of software, including a wide range of special interest groups, classes, and special events. In particular, I'd like to draw your attention to two special programs that are coming up. April is Nanotechnology Month at SD Forum, and we're offering a four-session uh, mini-series on nanotechnology. The sessions in this series will cover nanomaterials, tools, and the relationship of nanotechnology to biotechnology and information technology. The, seconds, the sessions take place the first Monday of, the, of each week in April, and they'll be held here in the Park Auditorium. Uh, secondly, I'd like to mention our monthly executive le leadership series, which was developed by White and Lee in conjunction with Price Waterhouse Coopers. And the series focuses on what you need to know to lead a company. Uh, for example, today's half-day seminar looked at how to develop and maintain effective communication with your board. In addition um, to our meetings and seminar, we have an expanding uh, collection of member benefits, including a 20% discount at Borders Books, 20% discount on uh, UC Santa Cruz extension classes, discounted access to a wide range of uh, conferences and seminars, and we're working on some additional member benefits, so stay tuned. Now, before we get to tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's coming up next month, because SD Forum and our partners, the Computer History Museum, are teaming up to present a double header, featuring one of the towering figures of computing, Fred Brooks. Brooks was an architect of IBM's Hurricane and Stretch computers, and led, then led the development of the System 360. Uh, he's the author of numerous influential books and papers, and in particular, the Mythical Man Month is widely regarded as perhaps the most important book ever written on software engineering management. He founded the Computer Science Department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's received just about every major medal, or award, I should say, in the field of computing, including the National Medal of Technology, the ACM Turing Award, and the John von Neumann Medal of the IEEE. So, why is it a double header? On Wednesday, April 7th, Fred will, Fred will participate in a panel discussion at the Computer History Museum celebrating the 40th anniversary of System 360. And then the next night, here as, par or as part of our Distinguished Speaker Series, Fred is going to be telling us what he's working on now which is the research into the uses and, and the, the effective implementation of uh, virtual reality environments. So in order to make this happen, we had to deviate a little bit from our customary uh, schedule and, uh, and lo meeting location. The date will be the second Thursday of April, the 8th, not the customary third Thursday. And because of this day change, we're going to be meeting not here, but at the Slack Auditorium in Menlo Park. So if you come here or you come here on our usual date, you'll be at the wrong date and time, so keep that in mind. Um, 
Now, I expect that we're going to have a full house uh, for Brooks' talk, so I'd suggest that uh, you make your reservation early. Now, to stay up to date on uh, this and other SD Forum events, um, I encourage you, if you've not already done so, to subscribe to the SD Forum mailing list, or, or event, SD Forum, I should say, events mailing list. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby, or you can go to our website, www.sdforum.org. And now for some words from our co-hosts. The Computer History Museum has been the primary co-host of this series since its inception. And John Toole is its exec executive director, and John's going to say a few words about what's happening currently at the museum. John? Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, has, has everyone heard of the Computer History Museum here? It's a good crowd. Um, um, <laughs> our, our mission is really to preserve the artifacts and stories of the information age. That's hardware, software, networking, and a whole host of program, public programs that we also put on and we're really growing into. Uh, some of our biggest news, and, and Bill Coleman, I had the honor of actually giving him a tour in the old World War II buildings at NASA Field. Um, one that was about a year and a half ago, Bill, I think, for the first time. We've since moved, of course. We're now at uh, Shoreline uh, Boulevard, 1401 North Shoreline, in the old SGI building, which is claimed to be our largest artifact. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 other, the other most interesting thing about that building, of course, is that was really, we think it was built as a museum, but they just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> It's really turned out to be a terrific building. It's really our first phase. We have public tours and one small part of our ex exhibition called Visible Storage, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday afternoons. Uh, we have a wonderful docent-led tour, some of the docents we've been here. You can pick up more information on us in the back um, and take a look. And I also just want to highlight a couple of interesting initiatives that we are involved with in the software world because uh, while we've got some big hunks of iron that kind of reminisce, uh, and of course, Systems are really hardware, software, and the people and the innovation of the people that really made it all happen. That's what we're really trying to convey and preserve and not lose those stories and all the hard work that you and others and, and generations beyond will try to have some respect for in the future. But we're doing a couple of interesting things. One is a software collections initiative uh, in many different dimensions. So if you're interested in what it takes to collect software and what you should be doing, think about collecting software or exhibiting software for that matter, uh, please grab me some time and I'll, I'll plug you into some of the groups that we've, we're talking about. Secondly, you'll be seeing shortly some of our cyber archives, if you will. We've, we're making a fairly major push in that over the next six months to a year and you'll be seeing more and more information available on the web so more and more people can become accessible. And I do want to say that uh, we're, we're thrilled to uh, have this double header that Sandy was talking about. I also want to just point out on April 7th, there are some other blockbuster people that will be on the, the, the podium with Fred, uh, Eric Block, Bob Evans, and Nick D'Onofrio. If you don't know who they are, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, uh, we've got some great programs coming up even next week. Uh, the Osborne Odyssey, Lee Felsenstein, Richard Frank, and Jack Melkor with John Markoff as our moderator. So we do these joint sessions, we do, do videotapes of them, that becomes part of our public archive. Uh, even this evening will be part of our public archive. And thank you very much for your time and I hope you can come visit us sometime. Thanks. Thanks, In addition to our general series co-hosts, um, we sometimes have co-hosts for particular events. And we're delighted that this evening uh, the Haas, Berkeley Haas School of Business Alumni Association is co-hosting the talk. Don, Dan Rossler is president of the South Bay chapter and uh, Dan has a few words to say. Um, just briefly, just want to thank Sandy uh, for uh, inviting us uh, to participate in this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Haas people here. I, I guess I should say, so you guys all know the Haas Alumni Network? It's not as exciting maybe as the uh, museum, but um, for those who don't know, uh, we're an organization of over 36,000 alumni, of which 5,000 approximately are in the South Bay alone. Uh, we do a lot of activities and events really with three main goals, the first being connecting alumni with each other, uh, events having to do with professional and personal development, which of course this is one of them, and uh, also activities that help promote the school, uh, both for current students and um, for uh, alumni. Um, I actually have a uh, background software product management, so maybe 
uh, to fit more into the, the correct um, <laughs> sort of theme of the environment. Uh, all the other people around here with ties, I'm assuming you're Haas alums as well. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and finally, I'll just say that uh, if you're interested in learning more about um, our chapter, uh, you can go to haas.berkeley.edu, and uh, there's information there. And many of you are already on our mailing list, so you'll receive event, uh, information about future events like this and others we do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Well, the Distinguished Speaker Series presents people whose leadership and creativity have advanced the state of the art in software development, or, or who have helped us understand the role of software in the larger society, speaking on topics of current interest. Tonight's speaker, as you well know, is Bill Coleman, CEO of Cassatt Corporation. Now, as I talked to people about Bill, two phrases kept coming up, goal-oriented and big opportunity. Now, Bill, it seems, originally wanted to be an astronaut. So he went to the Air Force Academy. He served as Chief of Satellite Operations in the Office of the Secretary of the Air Force. But, unfortunately, he wasn't accepted into the shuttle program, so he decided that his big opportunity lay elsewhere in computing. He earned master's degrees in computer science and engineering from Stanford, and soon was director of product development at Visicorp. Now, having vowed that he would run a software development at a Fortune 500 company by age 45, Bill at 42 became vice president of system software at Sun, overseeing Sun OS, Solaris, and related products. And at Sun, he helped transform the company from a maker of workstations focused at engineers to a maker of servers powering the internet. Well, Bill's next goal was to run a $100 million software company by age 50, I'm told. And his experience at Sun told him that if, in Sun words, Sun's words, the network is the computer, then that computer needed an operating system. So along with Ed Scott and Al Schwang, Bill in 1995 founded BEA to provide the middleware that combines all the computers onto a, on, on the network into a coherent whole. Within a few years, BEA exceeded $1 billion in, in the annual revenue. So much for that goal. Now, you'd think that with all of these accomplishments, Bill would decide it's time to relax. At least I would have, but apparently not. Bill still has his, set, his sights set on the next big thing, and that's what he's here about to tell us about this evening. Bill Coleman. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today, Sandy, and. Uh, and the uh, co-sponsors, the History Museum, John, uh, Computer History Museum, fabulous place. If you haven't been, you just have to go through. And any of you who've been in the computer industry as long as I have, you'll see a lot of old friends there. That, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've been in this valley for 33 years, and I've bumped into a number of people that I've worked at, at different companies with over the, those years here tonight. And I've got to say, we all have a lot more gray hair, or a lot less, but still gray hair. At any rate, we're up. Now, when we talked about what I should talk about, the idea of the next great, the next big thing came up. And uh, I want to start with some disclaimers. I mean, the first disclaimer is, you know, I'm not Alan Kay, and I don't invent the future. Uh, he did a great job in lots of industries, you know, he and his compatriots from here. Uh, but I, knew, I, I do know one thing about the future. Any prediction of what the future is going to be is certainly going to be wrong in some aspect. So with that disclaimer, uh, let me get started. Um, well, I have one more disclaimer. If you're here to hear about technology, I'm going to disappoint you. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the trends that technology takes. And I'm going to do it through a model, and, you know, this thing 
um, about trying to create big ideas, I think you have to sort of have a model and lens through which to view what happens and to test it when it's going forward. So I do have a model, uh, and I'm going to talk about that, that, in a, that in a middle. But my basis, basic assumption always has been that it's actually not about technology. It's about, and this is very important, it's about the innovation to apply technology in a way that it can do two things. Increase productivity and bring value. I'm going to talk about that. So those are, there's three important words there, because these are the basis for the model I'm going to talk about. Innovation, productivity, and value. Um, now, the model has to have a view of history. So we start with innovation. And the kind of innovation I'm talking about is rare. Um, and it's rare because entrepreneurship and building enterprises of value based on technolo technology is about having the vision to determine how to apply technology to bring values for customers. So there's a couple here, people here I can see from Kazat, they're getting tired of hearing my three Vs, vision, value, and values. People buy from people. You can't hire anybody who's any good. They don't believe in your vision and your values. But I won't, I won't bore you with that, ho that whole talk. It's just one of the three elements. So let's start with productivity. Now, there's nothing that's happened that's advanced anything about our state of life on this planet in 15,000 years that doesn't have to do with productivity. Productivity is the basis of everything. Being able to produce more goods and services without, with the same amount of resources. Productivity is the basis for advancement. So when you think of productivity, what, you, what you're looking for is what we euphemistically call a free lunch. How do you get more for less or more for without it applying any more resources? There's lots of ways to allocate resources, but there's only two free lunches. One is innovation, and, I, and I, I came, I'm coming back to innovation again. It's the innovation to apply technology in a way that improves productivity. And the second is specialization, and that's an important one, too, that, we're gonna ha that we'll come back to. Specialization is once you've innovated to create something, you, reduce, you more and more reduce it to practice, and the specialized parts become easier and easier to duplicate, and then they diffuse around the world. And by the way, the big argument on that now is called offshoring. But it's the natural order of things, because without specialization, the other major specialization of global world is free trade. Now, innovation, historically, when we look back, has moved from one major area to another. And it starts it, it, in the big picture, the way we break history down. We, we call them revolutions. You know, and all of us that have lived through revolutions know that they're all, they only look like a revolution in the rearview mirror. They look like a real tough time uh, when you're going through them. When uh, Washington won his first battle at Trenton in a Christmas day of 1776, he didn't think he had seven and a half more years of war to go. Uh, but that was a revolution. We've had, you know, we basically have had three revolutions, obviously, agricultural, uh, industrial and um, information. The thing about those, they all revolved on innovation in a different media. Agriculture was on natural resources. Industrial was on capital. Inf the information is obvious on, on inf information or information processing. This is just a little background. I'm going to get to the, the real meat of it later, but unless you understand this. So each one is a so much X improvement. If you say 10X, you'd sort of be wrong. It was like 50% in the first, 200% in the second. And I contend it's going to be uh, 1,000 to 10,000% in the third by the time it's, it's all done. Revolutions proceed in cycles. So we can talk about, I'll talk about the cycles. You, you all know about the Industrial Revolution and uh, the first industrial, the second, et cetera. There actually were 
four major cycles there. But within each cycle, there are a series of phases, and we just came through. Every cycle has two phases for sure, which is invention and exploitation. We invent technologies over a period of time, we exploit those technologies. Every once in a while, enough technologies come together that are being exploited that they literally undermine the economics of everything that was done before. And then you have, usually have a huge capital speculation boom. And that's what we just went through. The problem is people lose, lose value of two things. First is capital. Money is free, you know? And the second is the value you're bringing from customers. Well, if they don't buy it, they just don't get it and they don't matter. I just got to get a few more eyeballs. Well, eyeballs looking at a screen never brought, never brought the kind of value that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, but of, occasionally that happens. In, and in the Industrial Revolution, it's actually happened five times. Boom, bust, and then you go through a long period of build out. The boom is about what the innovation, what, the, the key to innovation is that innovation doesn't happen in a straight line. It's very Darwinian. And the boom is about a bunch of, of experiments that couldn't possibly be funded under ordinary circumstances that throw all sorts of things that fail on the wall for all sorts of ideas. But eventually, natural selection selects where there's some value to somebody. So that. At that point, you have a long build-out. The build-outs last decade or decades, and we're just at the beginning of it. All the value comes from the build-out. There's a huge amount of value. And along the way, you have something called diffusion. And diffusion is when the technology, is, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> is re reduced to practice enough that the value added doesn't take the kind of intellectual property and isn't as differentiable as it was before. And then what comes into place is specialization in terms of what's called labor arbitrage. And that means that it's, it, it is much easier to go to India today to do the back office, to do the testing, to do the support. Uh, you can train those kind of people. You need to do that because you've got to keep moving to the higher and higher level or you're going to get to the point that you will be held, you, you, your company will go out of business or your country will have the kind of problems that Singapore is fighting like crazy now. They had a phenomenal era where they, were, where they were one of the five tigers that won in the diffusion of the final stage of the Industrial Revolution. But what do they do next now that they've got this big neighbor, neighbor next door that's diffusing that even more? So diffusion is it, it's not only appropriate, it's necessary to keep moving up that, uh, that triangle. You just have to keep understanding where, where the value is coming from. And that's what I'm going to try to talk to you about tonight. So let's talk about value. The natural selection of any of these things is about somebody's got to get enough value. This is an important phrase to justify their switching costs. I, I, I used to use Visa as an example for this. Visa still actually runs their back end processing of your credit card bills in a batch run every night on, a set, on software that was written in, 1960, in the late 1960s. Mo in a bunch of centers now, but up here on the peninsula is their main, main headquarters. They had no, the mini computer and the main, the main frames, what they wrote it on, the mini computer, the PC, client server, never justified the, the $400 million it would take to rewrite that software and the 10 years and retraining of all their people. It already worked. The only thing that's, that, that, made, that made them sit up and look is when the net came along and they, they said, holy mackerel, in 10 years, Anybody can offer this kind of credit and give added value services, and we could lose our whole franchise. Why don't we do that? The value proposition justified the switching costs. They can reach all the endpoints for free on the net, so they're in a 10-year process of moving that forward, and they start from the outside and eat in. The value proposition has to justify the switching costs. The other thing is, uh, if you're trying to build a company around it, it better be urgent and not just important to them because otherwise you'll never get them to sign the PO. So now, we're now we've broken this down. <clears throat> Technology constantly is invented. And some of it even gets exploited, and you can make some money out of it. But occasionally, you get to the point that innovation really propels a change, and you look for those dislocations. Because it's the dislocations 
that create the innovator's dilemma, that undermine the economics of the old way of doing things, that create the opportunity that people will switch. You know, the famous study that showed that for 50 years from the 1920s to the mid-1970s, the, of the 50 leading industries, the top one and two players didn't change. It's because there was nothing that justified that switching cost. You get one or two percents a year. When the dislocations come along, it changes phenomenally. So now, you understand my model. I'm going to use this model, look at, the, look at it through the lens of the Industrial Revolution very quickly, bring us up to date on the Information Revolution, tell you what I think is the final step. I think that's the next big thing. I'm going to take a real chance, and I'm going to tell you what I think the next revolution is. So as I said, my, no matter what you do to predict the future, you're guaranteed to be wrong, at least in one aspect. So you'll get my, my uh, you know, unidimensional view of this. So what happened in the Industrial Revolution? Remember I said they have cycles, had four cycles. The first Industrial Revolution in, in the late 18th century invented the ability to power production, steam engines, canals, et cetera. The, sec the railroad and, and telegraph or, or communications revolution in the second part of the 19th century created the ability to extend your supply and distribution chains. Then the, the heavy manufacturing revolution happened in the end of the 19th century around steel, the, able to, the ability to build large shipping, et cetera. And then finally, the revolution that happened, uh, we all think about Ford. Well, Ford started a whole series of things that created the mass market. What did it create? It created mass production, mass marketing, and mass distribution. That was what happened as all those things came together. There were five, during that, that time period, there actually were five instances of boom, bust, and build out. And if you uh, want to read the best canonical uh, report on that ever written, it was written by a woman by, from Venezuela, of all places, named Carlotta Perez, called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, the Dynamics of, bub of Bubbles and Golden Ages. It was only written in uh, uh, late 2000, November of 2002. Easy read, but it really will give you a, an interesting viewpoint on that if you haven't had a chance to read it already. So what happened in that? We created what's called the chain of commerce. And this is important because we're about to uncreate it. And the chain of commerce said, instead of being a mercantile society, which we couldn't create large manufacturing global companies by and large, you know, uh, by the 1840s, the largest production company in the United States was 400 people, and they produced ammunition in Springfield and, and rifles in Springfield, Massachusetts. But because we could now automate production, we could produce a lot more things. Because we had trains and telegraphs, we could source our products from, uh, from a lot more distance, and we could distribute them. So the chain of commerce says, we go from what we, the wood we can cut to build the dresser to sell to the neighbor in your local village to this whole global chain of commerce. And that created capitalism. You have, that's why I said this one was about capital. You have to deploy a lot of capital to do it. It was all about capital. That's why it's called capitalism. It also is a very long chain of commerce from you predict months or a year in advance how much of what you're going to sell, you source the parts, you manufacture them, you put them out through your distribution channel, and hopefully you get paid at the end of it. Lots of capital deployed there and a long chain of commerce. But it's, and it's done in mass quantities. That's why it's mass production. These are important words. <clears throat> because this will give you the insight of what the final cycle of the information revolution is. So now let's go back to the information revolution. We've had cycles too. Pardon me. We used to like to call them waves, right? The mainframe, the mini computer, the PC, and then the network. So we've had four cycles. And there's, uh, we're in the, uh, the final, we're going into the final cycle now. The interesting part of it is, you know, we all remember the famous Sloan study of about 10 years ago that looked back at the IT productivity curves relating to the, to the gro gross domestic product of the United States and made the what we thought was an outlandish claim 
that IT had contributed nothing to the productivity of the GDP in the United States. And I don't think it was outlandish. It did not change the process any bit about how we did business. We still had the same capital-based, long chain of commerce. You know, I was involved with VisiCalc, and I remember by the end of the 1990s, I, I used to say, the only thing the PC did was replace the typewriter and the adding machine. I, you know, when we first were doing alpha testing and getting ready to use Vis, uh, for VisiCalc back in 80 or 81, I remember using it as, te uh, you know, being one of the te testers uh, to do budgeting for VisiCorp. And having done budgets for eight or nine years by then, where you'd go into your vice president you know, in the cycle, and you'd wor have worked all weekend long, and in five minutes, he'd look at it and say, I want this, 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 this changed. And you go, damn, I can't go. It'll take me all night long. You come back in the next morning. All of a sudden, I felt like my hands were on fire. How many people saw the budgeting process in a major corporation go from four months to three days? No increase in productivity. You just got to do lots more modeling, you know? And uh, became the battle of the spreadsheets. So we didn't really increase productivity. We didn't change the way we did things. We invented some technology that we could exploit, and it didn't change much. It made things maybe a little more efficient. <clears throat> but the net came along. All of a sudden, things were a little different. And some experiments started to happen. You know, this is that Darwinian prog progress process, where people were experimenting with the chain of commerce. They didn't know they were, but they were experimenting with the chain of commerce. They were changing the economics in their business. So we now call this business agility, and it was invented by two companies, Dell and Walmart. They used handcrafted systems to change the, the entire chain of commerce. In Dell's sense, they started it with the endpoints. I can touch all my customers for free, so why do I, wh why not let them self-order? I'll let them self-configure, too. Oh, and by the way, I'll, I'll do my supply chain so I can cut that way down. And they took what was taking six to nine months for end-to-end -end from the time you bought, a pr you bought the piece parts at Compaq till the customer actually bought it, down to seven days. They took the capital out. Matter of fact, because they got to the point that their accounts payable were longer than their accounts receivable on your credit card, they have a negative cost of capital. They're no longer in the, they were no, this was like 1998, 90, that they crossed that point. They're no longer in the, cat, the aid, in the industrial revolution, they're in the information revolution. They're no longer based on capital, they're based on information. And by the way, they could change the way, they could bring in lots of other things, let the customer self-configure, they get more revenues, it just builds on itself. So they created business agility, and they changed the PC market. Walmart did the same thing starting with the supply chain, right? And we all know those stories. Thank goodness they run on DEA software. Um, <laughs> but, well, the tuxedo and you know, some other stuff. Uh, but they started with uh, the supply chain. They, they got their inventory turned down, they, they really cut it, they turned over the management to their suppliers, but they did more than that. They turned over the merchandising of every store to the general manager of the local store and gave him the, or her the tools to let the store reconfigure itself to what the local environment buys and sells. So they turned this whole thing upside down. Now, of course, you know the story there. They're the largest, they're the largest corporation in sales in the world, highly profitable, et cetera. They created business agility. And they used IT to do it, but it was really hard. Lots of things they had to change, and they had to do a lot of hand tooling. But they were able to do it, so they created a model. Now, there's a famous McKinsey study that was published in September of 2001 that looked at productivity increase for the last half of the 1990s. Really interesting study if you read it. They basically attribute one and a quarter percent a year of GDP improvement to IT. First time that's ever been done. And then they broke it down by industry sectors. And they found out only two industries accounted for 40% of that improvement. 
and it happened to be the PC industry and the retail industry. Then they broke it down further, and they found out a quarter percent a year of that productivity improvement in the whole GDP of the United States was accounted for by Dell and Walmart. They changed the model of their industry. Now, something else has happened in the last few years. Three companies have emerged with an entirely different way of looking at their chain of commerce. And this is Darwinian experiments, but they are blowing away the market. They're called Amazon, eBay, and Google. Now, the interesting point with them is the entire chain of commerce out of the Industrial Revolution is a push model. Mass production, mass distribution, mass marketing. I make what I think you want, I push it out, and you get to buy it. That's it. That's why we call it mass. They turned it into a pull market. Their whole business model makes no assumptions about how people are going to use their product, how they're going to combine it, or how they're going to ask for it, or where they're going to ask for it. The ends are in charge. And they keep evolving and adding and changing based on how the ends. So they're leveraging another interesting thing about the net. The fact that there's an unlimited reach, free reach, for self-service everybody everywhere anytime at any point of your chain of commerce. So with those points in mind, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, just with where we are today, by at the end of the, net, the, the first build out of the network itself, the infrastructure we put in place is so rich and the diffusion of talents is so great, you don't have to even know that the people that are doing the internationalization or the testing or the support or the back end, whatever, happen to be located in some other continent. The, you know, we've, we've eliminated distance because of it. That's why offshoring and diffusion are working and have to work. It's the natural order. That is globalization. That is globalization. But it is the other part. Innovation improves productivity but brings value, and then it diffuses and creates specialization that increases uh, value on a global basis. The Industrial Revolution is completing that diffusion today, and it's what's brought China to, to the, in, into a second world country moving forward rapidly towards a first world. They'll add well over 100 million people to the middle class in the, in the next six years of this decade. And India is being brought forward by the diffusion of the information revolution. And of course, China will take advantage of that as well. So where are we? We have a little problem right now in that we haven't reduced to practice the technology that allow companies, organizations to easily do what Dell and Walmart did and turn themselves into a push model. To turn yourself into a push model, you have to exploit the killer app of the web. And the killer app of the web isn't going to be like spreadsheet. There's been three killer apps, right? The spreadsheet, electronic, uh, electronic mail, and, and the, the web, the you know, Burnsley uh, free reach. The killer app of the web for what I'm talking about is the fact that, you can t that everyone in the world in every part of your chain of commerce can self-serve. If you have the technology and systems in place, you can understand what's going on there in 360 degrees for your customers, suppliers, partners, competitors. And you can use that real-time business intelligence, if you can, to change and adapt in real time what you're doing. Well, the problem with our business systems today is they don't actually support that. But the, what's going to happen between now and 2020, I th I'm about to tell you at the very high level. Um, this is the build-out phase of the information revolution. And I think it'll take from now through 2020 for it to happen. You'll understand why in a minute. And then diffusion will go on for another 50 years. But what we have to do is build out the infrastructure that we can do that. Enterprises today cannot exploit straight through processing because everything's built in silos, in applications that duplicate one another all the way through. Remember the chain of commerce? There's supply, production, and distribution chain. 
So what are the three big generic applications in the world? ERP, supply chain, and Salesforce automation. We call it CRM, but CRM is not an application. CRM is a, tech, is a hope for a technology to be able to access and leverage all this real-time business intelligence so I can change what I'm doing in the middle. How can I change what I'm doing in the middle when I have a hard-coded application in my ERP that has a model of a customer and a model of a sales order that's different from the model in my supply chain and the model in my, uh, in my Salesforce automation. And by the way, those applications hard code what I do and how I do it and don't let me change that. You know, that goes back to the canonical example of a decade ago of MCI taking a million, billion dollars worth of business from AT&T in one year because AT&T couldn't change their billing system to compete with friends and family. So if you can't change, that's just policy. If I just can't change that policy, it takes me a year to do it, somebody's going to undermine it. So this is the basis of where this disrupt disruption is going to happen. We have to first look at what kind of software systems will be able to allow the policy, the process of what I do, could take an order, for example, the policy of how I process that order, and the workflow to be extracted from the application. Well, I'm obviously talking about a service-oriented architecture. And the service-oriented architecture will be the second inflection point that'll happen in the rest of this decade. The, uh, I, I believe it's really the last two to three years of this decade will hit its inflection point because we need darn winning experiments. There are a couple of very, very big companies in the, some of the biggest companies in the, two of the global 100 I know who are doing this top down, I'm gonna change the whole world, build a service oriented architecture. Well, those will fail. We all know those kind of pro projects fail. It's gonna take lots of experiments for the bottoms up until things get solid enough and we start to see uh, a Dell and a Walmart emerge in different markets later in this decade that disrupt the economics in the whole market. And then the inflection point will go crazy. The, the thing about service-oriented architecture is very simple. We've reinvented the operating system. The web app server is the operating system for the network. Why? It does two things. It takes every line of code out of an application that knows whether it's running on one computer with one operating system or end by end. So dis distribution comes for free. The net is distributed. It supports an open component assembly model. That's all it does. It's a runtime. So we have a new operating system. Now, how do you make these applications talk to one another? You can't code into every application, the ability for every, everything to talk to one another. And that's where web services come in. They allow a call from for a service from one service module to another where there is no a priori knowledge of where the service is located, how to call it, what form the, the data is in. It just happens. And of course, then if you put a workflow event manager in between the two, guess what? You, you, you have just given the ability to extract policy process and workflow in your organization and you're given the chance that now you can adapt based on this real-time business intelligence. Service-oriented architecture will happen. It'll dominate the world. It'll turn the finite number of applications that we have to manage, and this is the key to the problem, into two or three orders of magnitude more services that are distributing in real time across your enterprise. So there's a problem there, but there's an opportunity. We still have some things to finish. We all know that, security, distribution, you know, these things will be solved. The technology is because the value is there and it can already be seen. Um, with the tools, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I like to think that, uh, that BEA has uh, sort of invented the next mode of what a tool will be for assembling enterprise applications. Uh, but technology is something other people will adapt to and, and uh, uh, I'll just say here, no one will ever catch up. You know, like I said, predicting the future is, uh, Usually wrong. The, the other thing that's going to happen, so this is the componentization, the diffusion of the software base. The same thing's going to happen with the hardware base. Because whether we believe it or not, and whether the terms change or not, clustering, grid, utility computing, it, it's going to happen. Uh, it, but we're still, if the inflection point for SOA is the end of the decade, the inflection point for, for that is 
one to three years. Because where SOA is, has a value proposition that justifies the switching costs if so you're competing against someone who can take your business away from you, grid computing really doesn't. Now, utility computing may when we get to that model, uh, but grid computing doesn't. You got to think of it this way. As a percentage of IT cost, the total capital for the hardware is less than 10%. That's a not, even if you can cut it in half or by, uh, by uh, an order of magnitude, it doesn't justify the switching cost. There are three problems today. First place, it is nowhere near as cheap as anybody thinks because of two big factors. One is the interconnect technology is so complex and so expensive that you can pile up a lot of cheap things. But when you start putting high, really high speed uh, interconnects on them, the cost goes through the roof, your wiring goes through the roof, it's just, it, the costs are too high. The second is, the, the, you, it, it's, it's not easy to manage. The pi, it, it's just not easy to manage, install, manage, and run. So that software has got to get a little farther. I hope to think that's just the first 5% of what uh, my new company can help solve but there are a lot of people in that game. Uh, and the third is, somebody has to take all that and turn it into the just commodity, rack them and stack them with, you know, plug a couple of 10, 10 gig ethernets on the back so I don't worry about the cabling, I don't worry about managing something any different, you can just pile it up, it's really cheap. You know, these blade servers are too expensive, too complex, they're not gonna be the answer. They, they, they don't really make that much of a difference to replace an SMP. The fourth thing is, because it doesn't justify the switching cost, people will only switch when, they, when the um, depreciation of their current hardware is zero. So it will be a much more gradual market. And, until, and, and as it proceeds, there will be a huge battle that goes on between scale out or scale up. For those of you who don't know what that means, scale up is built, take a really big computer and put everything on it, mainframes or big SMPs, or scale out is lots of little teeny two and four processor Intel boxes just pumping up. When SOA hits, scale out trumps scale up. There's no other, it, it, scale out will just, scale up doesn't make any sense. It'll just go crazy. So we have another barrier, another problem here. You're going to take an IT organization that 70 to 80 percent of its costs are in management and operations, and you're going to tell it to manage two to three orders of magnitude more things. I don't care whether you call it autonomic computing or what, we need an operations fabric that guarantees, at least at the provisioning level, uh, the ability to self-configure, self-optimize, self-heal, and to some extent provide the basis for um, uh, self-protection. There aren't enough people in the world to manage that environment and it, therefore it has to get here. Now, that's the business Cassatt's in, that's the business that many companies are in and our friends at HP and IBM and, and Sun all have their projects and um, I love this kind of environment. The, uh, I always think the independent uh, company with an open uh, strategy that doesn't involve going out and rewiring every application before you can turn on the first thing is going to win. So stay tuned, maybe you'll see that. All these things are going to happen because this is too dramatic. It's way too dramatic. It's orders of magnitude improvement in productivity. Dramatic lowering of the amount of capital that's needed. The ability to fuse your, 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 glo your global supply chains beyond, beyond belief. And when it's done, one other thing's gonna happen along the way. Remember those big three applications I talked about? ERP supply chain and Salesforce automation? They're gonna disintegrate. Literally disintegrate. They're gonna be gone. Because you can't afford to have applications in the, the way we understand them today that lock you into process and policy and workflow You've got to be able to adapt them. Now, that's why I say it's going to take till 2020. It's all, it'll start on the edges. It always does. The things that have to change the most are the things that are on the edges. So the thing that goes out to sa the sales force for CRM, 
and the thing that goes, goes out to, uh, I mean, to Salesforce for, for that side and supply chain for that side will disintegrate first. And then gradually the back end will happen over a peri period of a decade. Just because straight through processing is the enabler for, and the adaptability and the agility it brings for this whole killer app of the web. So what's that gonna result in? Well, the first thing is it really will, we really will get to these promises that we had back in 1999 will come true in 2020, by 2020. We really will have an agile environment. You know, and someday we're gonna be, sit we're gonna be sitting retired somewhere and we're gonna be talking about that revolution we, li we lived through. I remember when it started in 1968, or, or uh, Fred Brooks is gonna say 66 or 65, and, uh, and, that, and finally got there. But in the you know, rear view mirror, it'll look like a, a revolution. It really will happen. We will have an adaptive real-time business. We, it will involve creative destruction. You know, that creative destruction is the economic term that Joseph Schumpeter came up with in 1942 to say what the greater economic thing is for the innovator's dilemma, that basically every one of these major revolutions has destroyed everything that came before it economically. So what is that going to mean? Well, the first industry that's gonna get destroyed from top to bottom is the technology industry. Because most of the players, the economics of what, where they currently are today are, it's, it will be impossible to change those fast enough. I, the, you, when the economic changes in order of magnitude, economy changes in order of magnitude uh, levels, you get, in, you, you get into a, a negative feedback loop. I call it a deck spiral. And all of those, us who live to watching deck, you get to the point where your products are no longer competitive but the economics of your business won't let you lower the cost fast enough to keep up. And the only thing you can do is lay off the people that could build the next generation, and you, you, you have only two choices. You know, break up the pieces and sell it off, or go out of business. So it's really hard. Even in the minor cycles, very few companies survive, big companies who were leaders in the previous survive. A few do especially when they change the focus uh, uh, you know, of their economics, not their technology. But in the major dislocations, almost none do. So uh, you really, uh, I, I really do think that most of the big players that are there today, that have been around more than 10 years, probably won't be around in the form we know them as an independent in another, by 2020. But then it's, it's just gonna ripple across all industries. We'll, we'll create an entire new economic order. And, and I'll go one step farther. I think it will affect the political order. Matter of fact, I think it already is. Think of the difference between China four years ago and China now. China four years ago was playing brinks, brinksmanship uh, with Taiwan. You know, they were playing on a on, you know, brinksmanship with the United States. What they realized is that's just costing them money and defocusing them from the biggest war of all, keeping their GDP above 8%. They also realized they don't have to fight Taiwan. They're just absorbing it economically. And by the way, Taiwan would end up being a, a third world country if they didn't allow themselves to do that because they can't keep a manufacturing base in, uh, competitive in light of the big neighbor next door with a billion people that can just keep dropping the economics on them. So it's already happening. But the political order, at least the importance of the political order of geo, uh, now the wild card, of course, I, I can't talk about it at all because I have no basis for is terrorism, but I'm talking about in the first and second world. The other thing it'll do is increase productivity dramatically. Now the last, the industrial revolution in the last century created the middle class of the world as we know it. I believe that, that, that this level of productivity with its diffusion will take that to, ha to potentially by the end of this century, well over half the population of the world. The wild card is, the, uh, is the mostly south of the equator. 
And the problem with south of the equator is the uh, G6 and G7 tried to stop diffusion in the agricultural revolution. And that's what tariffs and food subsidies are about. And it's created a systemic barrier for anyone in the third world to emerge into a second world power. You can't do anything if you have no educated people and no electri electrical communication and transportation infrastructure except grow natural resources to sell. And if the, if the only buyers in the world are making it such that you can't even give them away for free, and by the way, they saddle you with a lot of, th of third world debt, it's a systemic barrier that, that they can't get out of. The good news, I think, is that we're getting a little smarter. In the Doha round a couple of years ago, in 2001, November of 2001, of the World WTO talks was phenomenal. Unfortunately, it fell apart uh, last September, but hold good thoughts there. What this is going to do is create a pull world where the ends rule, and everything is going to have to be not mass production, but mass customization. It sounds like a talk of five years ago. It's actually going to happen. So I actually think this is the 10x to 100x improvement we're going to see in the next 50 years. Now, I'll just really stick my neck out for a couple of minutes. Well, this won't take long at all. What's the next revolution? You know, all the revolutions have easy names, agriculture, industry, information. This one has a real easy name. It probably won't be this name because I'm, I'm going to predict something that's wrong. I'm going to call it the material revolution. And I'm going to say that it will, won't even begin until 2020. It'll take 50 years to get through a couple of phases of boom and bust. And the end of the century, we're going to start seeing real returns. And what it is, it's the convergence of nanobio and info. The convergence of nanobio and info. At the molecular level, there's no difference between uh, between the, the material world and the biological world, and we're going to learn to mass customize material. So that is going to be a productivity improvement, the likes of wi which I can't even estimate. So you guys get to hear this nano talk coming up. Uh, that's way, way out there stuff, but we're, but we're starting to play with it. We're inventing now. We aren't even to exploitation. Bio. We're inventing and start, just barely starting to exploit. But we've, all, we've just discovered the real thing, that we might be able to do something down at the level of the human genome and figure out what's really going on. We're going to have huge issues. But you know, as Stephen Hawking said in his latest book, um, in Universe in a Nutshell, if you take a 1,000-year perspective, you cannot stop it. We will re-engineer human DNA. So. Um, this is my view of the next big thing. I may or may, I, I'm probably wrong on most of it, but at least I gave you my rationale on how I got there. And now, I'm supposed to be done at eight. I'm two or three minutes late. We've got time for questions. So, uh, we've got two microphones here. And <coughs> when folks you want to ask a question, come on down and uh, ask a question. You know, the interesting part about this, it, what, what he, the question was, are there any interesting companies out there they, today we can look at that are looking at the world in a, di in a different way? Um, John Hegel wrote a book called Out of the Box, with trying to give some non-technical view of web services and where it's going. He, you know, he's got some interesting examples of companies that have engineered themselves around a, being a virtual global corporation. But on the, your, your question was about on the technology side. Are there any examples around today? I like to hope that, that my new company is. But uh, you know, I, I think this is yet another Darwinian evolutionary experience. And until the roads are laid, 
it's hard to see how the infrastructure on top of it is going to be assembled. Uh, but I, okay, Salesforce.com is a great company, they, and they and they, they they are taking advantage of the the one aspect of the network. They're also taking advantage of economics. People can buy by the drink. They're taking advantage of this urgency. Uh, the and they are actually extending web services to allow you to, to, as a user of their systems, to turn it around for your own customer, customers too. So they may be an example. But I'll give you the Darwinian part of it. Um, are they really an example? They're an example for one part, but they aren't providing the, the, the ability to do all this straight through processing. So if you use them today, you get a great CRM sort of application because it does give you the whole sales gives you the support side, you get view of the, view of the center, they're adding order processing. But, that, but that's not a whole corporation. And they're gonna have to figure out how they go to the next step, because if you're a company like mine looking at adopting them, but you have to de develop a whole bunch of other business systems, how do I hand wire in my ERP and my professional services system, my human resource system over here? So I think it's, they're part of the experimentation. And um, you know what I think is going to happen uh, is the uh, it's the Jeffrey Moore whole product. You first create the base, then you create the whole product. And my way I like to say it is, uh, if you're a platform, everything that is horizontal uh, it, horizontal uh, functionality that's not specific to any industry or um, it. Uh, or any market gets composted in, and that's how commoditization happens. We haven't finished that yet, but a lot of what we think of today as business services will get composted in. So now you have to go to the next level, and I think it's gonna be more about, we're talking about licensing software, I think it's gonna be more about that li licensing value-added service with it, so I think that uh, Salesforce has got any, an issue there. Um, I think that they tell, Telcos and ASPs will devolve into utility providers when the software and systems and commoditization happens. They will be, there'll be a huge price arbitrage there that will just make that into a low cost and will evolve into computing models that are sort of like the network of the telephone system today. You'll buy most of your capacity in the world by the drink. You'll have some inside your walls like you do a, a telephone, telephone switch. But that's gonna destroy the telecommunication industry it's going to destroy the, the, the big iron providers as we know them because they'll be really cheap uh, sort of things. It, and at this point, when you're now assembling and people already have all the capacity they need, the system integrators have to move way up to the next level where they're pro providing really McKinsey kind of services. So I, I just think that we're just in the beginning of that evolution. And I don't know if I can point you to any specific companies. Your comment about the, the rise of the, the middle class because of industrialization, and I guess an example might be is that you now have a mass producing factory producing stuff. You need salespeople to, um, to help sell it. Um, what, what I'm seeing right now is is that you know the you know the middlemen are going away with what's going on right now. And you you commented that the half the world will be middle class. I I don't. What will they be doing in this new world? I have no idea. <laughs> Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, that on a global basis, um, on a global basis, manufacturing is shrinking. Manufacturing uh, employment is shrimping, shrinking on a global basis. So it's not that we're just offshoring, it's going away. You know, and it'll go away increasingly uh, over time. But you know what? By historical rates, the employment in this, this country is, is very high. We think, you know, we talk about, oh my gosh, we're four, we had a year, a couple of years ago. Mid 5% is very high employment. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot, some interesting statistics. The percent of high school graduates in this country that graduate from college, that go to college now, have uh, gone from 35 to 53% in 20 years. We're moving up that pyramid. Uh, the future shock was written uh, in the late 60s, was about we're gonna be a services world and everybody's gonna be flipping pancakes at, uh, uh, at IHOP or, or working in McDonald's. We are becoming more of a services economy. And guess what? 
They're the highest end value added services in the world. We're the brain trust in the world for financial services, for legal telecommunications, for, so the jobs are being created. That's what productivity is all about. You don't have, because we only have 3% of the people in this country still work in agriculture, doesn't mean that we are, that, that we pine for the time that, for, that the other 47% that worked in it at the beginning of the last century are no longer on the farm. We're creating whole new industries at higher and higher value, and that's what this is all about. They create more productivity, they give more time for, for people to move forward. It's happened all the way through. The agricultural revolution, what did it do? It did have a hundredfold increase. In what? In the amount of human beings that could be supported per acre on this planet. We found something for them to do. None of those jobs were invented. I, I'm an optimist, and you know, oh, by the way, if you ever go to work for a startup and your entrepreneur is not an optimist, run. <laughs> You've provided a, a very compelling view of the future, and so I have a couple uh, questions or comments if you could uh, talk about. One is the acceleration and change, you know, the implications of that, i.e. companies being built faster and getting destroyed faster. And the other is, what will startups need to do differently to succeed in that environment? Uh, Drucker wrote a great book about four or five years ago called um, something about challenges in the 21st century. And he really talked about this. And it's about how fast you have to reinvent yourself. And it's all about intellectual property, in, uh, both from an individual point of view and a, and a company point of view. Uh, you know, the, look at this dilation of time. The agricultural revolution started 14,000 years ago. It went through its massive improvements in, two, in a couple of stages. One was in the Middle Ages, and then again with me mechanization in the Industrial Age. But that took 14,000 years. Probably, you know, all told, going to be about 250 years will tell the whole story of the Industrial Revolution. You know, once we basically eliminate manufacturing as we know it. And the information economy takes over. Probably, uh, I'm guessing it'll be 100 years for the information revolution. So I don't know what the nano, bio, info, material revolution is going to take. But there's a dilation of, of time here. You know, in the meantime, lifespan, in the last century, a lifespan in this country went up one day every four days. It's still going up that fast. Uh, in that degree of change, you, you, you got to learn how, you, you're going to have to learn how to change with it. And companies have to do the same thing. It is about focusing, I believe, on the three Bs. When we started BEA, we didn't have any technology. I had an epiphany in 1993. I call it that now. It sounds good. But at the time, it was just an idea. I talked about it earlier. It's a network computer. The network needs an operating system. Because no one can program into every application in the world the fact that it's distributed. So we got to give that for free. Being an operating system guy, I knew you couldn't do that with the thing that runs the hardware. Uh, so where was a new abstraction uh, you know, of software. Um, the, the thing is you have to envision the future. I didn't know what that technology would be. I just knew it had a couple of things. It would be based on an open set of standards, and it would support a, an open component assembly model. That's all I knew. So we went out and bought another piece of software called Tuxedo that was good. It was a distributed, it would sell to the same customers, and we used that to build a channel on a global basis. And then we just adapted. We let the technology, we let the customers tell us what value they wanted from the technology. We, just, we, we, we luckily decided early enough, well, we'll jump off this Corbo wagon and jump on this, you know. But that's, businesses not only have to be agile in how they respond to their customers, but they got to be agile in their whole business model. It will mean the, the degree of change will be rapid. And by the way, the, I believe the half-life of a major corporation will continue to come down, as it has in the last 50 years. If you look at how long the listings in the Fortune 500 have been in have been companies, they are getting shorter. So, yes, sir, great talk. And by the way, you didn't mention your great work at uh, University of Colorado Boulder, ah. where you have given one of the largest uh, research grants uh, mm -hmm. in uh, the history of funding at universities. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, thank you. I hope this crowd appreciates your contributions there. My question is about um, 
the one company you didn't mention that I thought you would mention in, among companies with uh, new models, and uh, Yahoo. And talk about um, what you think about service syndication in the service-oriented or, uh, architecture and that value chain. Uh, yeah, I actually think surface service syndication is is going to be a, a a model that will adapt a lot, and I think it's an important model. It will allow companies to come and go a lot faster. Uh, Yahoo, you know, I I used Google because they're the most popular example as a as a proxy. Yahoo is uh, Yahoo's a great company because they've already reinvented themselves. Uh, Semmel came there and reinvented their, their model on how they were going to extract value and the services they pro provided. They have adapted to it. Uh, and, and they've done it uh, better in some ways than Amazon. Amazon was just the great overextension. Then they realized that there, there wasn't the urgency of value in every kind of product to do over the net. There were in some markets, so they've come back down. But they tried to syndicate the reseller thing, and, uh, and I think because they didn't have the right business model, and in some cases the right systems behind it, it didn't work that well. But I believe it's gonna be a great model, because it's just another part of the virtual world where you can eh, leverage resources. So now we're gonna, be, you know, we talk about utility computing. What about utility distributing, and utility supplying, and utility, yeah, leverage those things. And it's gonna be different than the kind of, uh, exchanges we were trying to build five years ago that, you know, if I can just sell you your pencils two cents cheaper and run and make every supplier in the world go out of business, I'm going to make a lot of money. There aren't a lot of those around anymore. So. Hi, you mentioned earlier uh, the merging of nano and biotechnologies, and I'm wondering with respect to one area in particular, bioenergetics, what applications and opportunities you see coming out of that? Why don't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not an expert in those, in those areas, and, and I, I, I think I would, uh, I, I'd just be foolish to try to answer that, that question. You know, I'm on the IT side, and I haven't really looked at it very much. I, 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 you know, I do think a, you know, we're going to uh, change almost everything that we know about um, biolog biology, not just human, but um, you know, plant and animal for the better over the next hundred and hundreds of years. But the, uh, I think the biggest issue we have with that is uh, less technological and more moral and ethical. Um, I do think one of the biggest, from our work at the University of Colorado, and uh, that we started to see one of the biggest travesties going on in this country right now is the way we are appro approaching stem cell research. You know, uh, I do believe that if we would dramatically open up the lines in a very controlled way with a controlled program to get to the ability to, be, to uh, identify and grow immortal cells and then uh, take those forward to get to the islet cells and then get to the ability to we can make them immune system transparent. We could do things the like uh, for in dramatic ways for people uh, within 30 or 40 years, that, you know, that, that the visibility is there, and, um, but we're caught in a, um, we're, caught, we're caught in a political battle and not a real battle. All that's gonna mean is that this country doesn't get to be the one that capitalizes on these next generations if we don't watch it, and we'll be the one that's left as the second world country in 100 years because the Chinas and the, you know, Swedens and everybody else will do it. So, yeah. Hi, Bill. First of all, uh, thank you for the very informative talk. You, uh, you paint a very inspiring picture of what the future holds in terms of the infrastructure that will be built out. I recently uh, began working at a company called Saba, which uh, I think you're familiar with, but for those of you who don't know, uh, we make a enterprise level human capital management platform. And sort of my question for you is sort of as we look into the future when we have all of this technology infrastructure, would you be bullish on human capital and the, and the necessity to kind of keep people connected and smart about how to access this technology? Because uh, I, will, I will share with the audience, uh, right now I think we're sort of in the Darwinian phase, but I'm looking for some, some guidance like 
in 2020, would human capital, knowledge management, performance management, would those be exciting fields for the big opportunity, or? Uh, those are extremely exciting fields. That's sort of the, one of the main themes of that Drucker book I talked about. Um, you got there, there. There's only one problem. Um, they pass. We have the, more than we have more than one, but I'm well. No, I'm curious it, about what you're in, in the work in the value proposition thing. They pass the important test, but it's very hard to get them over the urgent test. So every CEO in the world will stand up and say, "I'm going to invest so much in training and 40 hours a week and da da da, da and go buy the tools," and then it comes to the end of the quarter. And I got a $5 million PO from you, and I have a $5 million PO that will generate me $10 million in the next quarter. Where's the urgency? So you got to find out how to create that urgency. It's going to be a long time to build. And I actually helped form a company and was on the board. I just got off the board because uh, I've got too much to do. That is the largest distance learning company in the world now. It's mm. called Skillsoft. And it is very hard to create that urgency. You've got to have a huge value proposition for folks that's right now. Now, the idea of being able to let people try before they buy, you know, and use the network to get them the progressive commitment where they're gaining more and more and they're buying it sort of virally, that, that you know, I think that's a better distribution model than thinking you could use the enterprise sales model and convince the, you know, the CXX or whatever of employee productivity that he's got to add this to their budget, a long sales cycle. Well, well, we'll try to take like a 2020 view and kind of report back on how it develops. But I hope you're thanks. successful. Thanks. Somebody's going to be successful there. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I work for BA, and uh, it was always a pleasure listening to you in the quarterly meetings. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a pleasure listening to you again today. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the the whole value chain of uh, who manufactures the final goods mm -hmm. and who are the components who supply to this final good. So if you look at the automobile industry as you talked, you know, we have these car manufacturer and then there are component manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And traditionally the component manufacturers get squeezed, right? I mean, you know, the margins are lower and lower as you keep going down the value chain. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing happened in the PC industry, you know, a lot of the electronics, electronics, at their time they were peaking, but again, you, know, you saw their margins reducing a lot more. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the companies who are manufacturing the final goods got much higher margins. Now the equivalent thing which, uh, and you know, I really wanted to get your, uh, what do you think? If you look at the trend in last three years especially, uh, companies like Procter & Gamble and things like that, they're trying to outsource their entire IT departments to HP, IBM Global Services, EDS, $10 billion contract. So in a way, their single most supplier is this SI who almost controls this IT dollars. Mm -hmm. So do you think they then dictate that who is the hardware supplier? And in this case, HP and IBM obviously have their own hardware arm also. And do you think the other players in the value chain will get squeezed because the IT dollars are now controlled by these four or five SIs? Um, so this is a question about I outsourcing of IT. Um, I've always thought that outsourcing of IT, I'll say this, is a bad idea. Um, but outsourcing of the low value added parts of IT is a good idea. You know, uh, we don't, BEA, I'm on the board of Symantec, we don't maintain our servers around the world. Symantec, you know, the big hits that ha la happened last summer in one, uh, viruses in one day, we had a three, now you, got, now you got to understand, this company has 82 million customers. And one day we had a 3,000% increase in downloads, 30 to one. The latency went up only five seconds for the average download. Want to know why? It's outsourced to Akamai. J.P. Morgan Chase just did a huge deal about a year ago with IBM to outsource IT. They outsourced all the operations of their back, of their back room. None of, the none of the application management design architecture. They just outsourced the lowest value part of it. And I believe that's absolutely, that part is already reduced. Why, why are you gonna be any better at managing a commodity set of servers, and I don't care where they are in the world with ban bandwidth. 
and that'll keep moving up. You know, at DEA, we've re-architected uh, over the last three years our entire system. It's a tire service-oriented architecture. In the back end, we have lots of applications bugs, PeopleSoft, Siebel, Documentum, and you know, the list goes on. Uh, clarify. There's nothing custom in those anymore. It's all been pulled out up into the app into the into the web services area, and we just use those as as processing backend engines. We even separated ourselves for the database with the liquid data, and we just took that all and threw it over into India and said, Accenture, run it. But it's not the value add. It's not what the part that makes a, a, our business agile. That and I think that's how this is going to go, because th those who don't. If IT is part of the productivity of your business and your ability to compete and you outsource it to somebody else, you're going to find you're not in business. The other thing that's going to happen by this is the IBM model of utility computing I actually think is going to end up being the Verizon and Akamai model of buy it by the drink. Now we've got some software issues and how we're going to do, uh, how we're going to guarantee the security and the capacity and bill by uh, time of day and whatever. but. That'll, that'll all get solved. And then IBM and Accenture won't be able to afford to do this anymore. Because w what is a telephone company, service company? What is it if it's not to provide some sort of digital services? Therefore, ultimately, they're going to win, the, whoever's left of that industry and the ASP industries. And they're going to charge. It's going to get so cheap, because they're going to be battling for that tenth of a percent margin. That's how, that's how markets commoditize. And then IBM and Accenture won't be able to afford to be in that business anymore. So that's how I think it's going to happen. We have about five more minutes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, for sharing, thanks for sharing your thoughts tonight. Yeah. Uh, you spoke briefly about the evolution of software, uh, the whole autonomic utility, et cetera. Uh, can you, share, can you uh, say something about the, how the business of software will evolve in the next 20 years, especially in light of what we're seeing in the open source world? And uh, Well, uh, so it's, uh, the big question is how will the business of software evolve? Uh, the, uh, I will say that in 20 years, software will be a, 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 a larger part of the global, uh, of the global economy, uh, and, and it will uh, it'll be a lot more diffuse than it is today. And I'm going to say it not because I'm going to tell you what the business model is. I'm going to say it for only one reason. If the future of the world is intellectual property, and if you can't extract any value from intellectual property, there's no future of the world. So if software is the basis for exploiting the adaptive nature, where I believe it'll become a bigger part of the economy. But then, I actually think lot parts of it will become much of much less value, uh, and you'll have to move to a higher and higher level. So uh, the, the real issue here Right now, everybody's battling is how do you price software and what, you know, what is the next big thing? How do you compete with the really big companies? I, I think we're going to see sort of creative destruction of the software industry. Let's take the infrastructure space. There are four different segments of things that are going on. There is the new one called application infrastructure. There's everything having to do with data infrastructure. There's everything having to do with security infrastructure. There's everything that happened to do with management infrastructure. The management infrastructure today is horrible. It's out of date, doesn't work, it's too expensive, it's got the wrong model. And, but what I believe is we're going through the consolidation of those now. Before the end of the decade, there's going to be a cross consolidation. Because you have to constantly take the platform, bring it more and more together, com uh, compost it, and move it up. So uh, I think that we're going to see massive consolidation. I think we will see a change in the way software's priced. I do not think that, um, uh, that the ASP model will be the only model. I think people will want to own something. So. What do you think about the open source model? Oh, I think the open source model is great. It doesn't, open source, ne, no open source never invents or disrupts. Os, open source provides uh, continuous improvement in what's already there in a, in a stable base. The other thing is the open source model isn't as generalizable as you think, because it's about ego gratification. There are about 200 people in the world that really, really do contribute to Linux. And there are about 50,000 that sit on the sidelines and say that was wrong. Well, 
Now, how many people in the world are going to get on and be open source because they want to be the best possible ledger accounting system in the world? It's not generalizable in intellectual property, but it does create continuous innovation and it composts things. Gio, how are you doing? Hi. <laughs> Here's one of the real pioneers in computer yeah. science. I mean, at the moment, with outsourcing, there's an incredible movement of IP to India and China because these people are being trained in methods that were developed here. Now, and a lot of them we brought over here and trained them and sent them back after the bus. Right. <laughs> OK, well, but that's all IP transfer that's mm -hmm. going on. Now, at the moment, that's very hard to caption to understand. So why are we worried if, for instance, for your stem cell research, the IP is developed in Sweden, it will be available here for free? Uh, on a global basis, we don't. We don't worry about it. Actually, on a global basis and taking a long view of things, we don't even care. Now, I mean, eventually, IP will be global and flow in both directions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, you you just you know, if if you want to if you want the economy to continue to grow uh, uh, at a first world level in this country, we can't afford to let the whole next revolution move somewhere else and leave us where in the only the part that doesn't add any value. Yeah, but if we can exploit the IP. And it doesn't that matter is the, where it comes from. And that's what we've been good at, because as it diffuses, you know, I mean, most of the, uh, uh, you know, auto manufacturing in the world in, the, in, the, uh, in between uh, 1910 and 2010 existed in the northeast region of the United States. Well, it doesn't hurt that it's all over the world now and that we're, uh, uh, our big three is now big two because one of them is owned by a German company and they're losing market share every year. I don't, yeah, it doesn't matter, yeah. Thanks, Gio. Before we take our last question, um, first of all, I want to remind everyone about our talk next month. It will be Fred Brooks uh, speaking on measure, making and measuring virtual environments. Again, I want to emphasize the talk will be on April 8th, not the customary third Thursday, and it will be at the Slack Auditorium, not here. Secondly, I want to thank our speaker this evening for a terrific talk. Thank you. 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 <laughs> well, we, we did win today, 71 to 45, but <laughs> in the... Uh... And now, uh, after our final question, we'll stay the journey. Of course, we save the best for last. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, to achieve the goal of straight through processing, we are definitely going to need some effective and complete straight through interoperation protocols. You might say a real lingua franca. Mm -hmm. A mechanic mechanism in the past has been the standards groups. Mm -hmm. And I think we could, in the context of be, being nice, playing nice together, say the standard gr standards groups have been developmentally or delivery challenged. So what's your prognosis for a sufficient set of standards to really achieve the goal of straight, forward pro straight through processing in terms of time, and you think it will be on the foundation that we currently call web services? Well, so what's my prognosis? Uh, the first place is I totally agree with you on standards groups. Uh, the last big success of global standards group was CCITT with FACS, and it was a great success because the Japanese took it and drove the price down, and all of a sudden everybody could have a fax, you know, um, and uh, it went crazy. All of the technologies that form the net didn't necessarily come, although they, in many ways, they've been uh, nicely nurtured by some standards groups. The nice thing about a standards group is like a government. It's not built to be efficient, and therefore it's not going to do anything. It's not going to be able to move things too forward too fast. But you know, TCP/IP and network protocols they didn't come out of standards group. You know, they came out of DARPA and you know and research that was going on and funded by the government. Um, do I think, uh, uh, what's my prognosis? Bill Gates was absolutely right. You know, uh, it, it's really about implementation and it's about getting it out there. 
And do I think web services is going to be good? Absolutely. I think web services will do it. You want to know why? There are three companies in the world that are uh, pioneering those standards, and they put their heads together about every six months. They decide what the next thing they're that's going to go into Oasis, and they just fight it forward. I'm being a little big-headed here, but it's, it, it's IBM, it's Microsoft, and it's BEA. And it's Adam Boss working on our side, and there's, a, and, you know, there's one or two guys on each side, and they decide. And by the way, we all know that we, there was no future for us if this doesn't work. Because the advantage of web services is, it, it, is it's a loose coupled model. And it is platform independent. Those things change everything about software. They make it possible to do service-oriented architectures. So there will be an implementations that will come out of these companies. Uh, I believe that BEA is leading right now. IBM's, I think, far behind in the actual implementation, but not far enough behind to not continue to move it and power it, and power it forward. And it's not going to take much. You know, I contend that Java got to where it did, not uh, because there was no, no real standards group. You had three entities that, that made it happen. You had Sun that paid huge amounts of money, and I don't know why they did, to have 800 or 1,000 engineers, you know, work on these standards and have this pseudo community process. You had IBM that validated to the world, and you had an independent player, BEA, that kept the two of them honest to not change it. And then you had a foil sitting on the side called Microsoft, and, they, and if we all tried to run away with it like we did in the Unix Wars days, it would have died. So my belief is it is going to happen. Now, web services are actually good enough to do a lot of things now if you're a pioneer inside your walls. A few things that you can expose outside in very controlled ways. So this isn't going to happen overnight. That's why I think there's an inflection curve and there's a bunch of experimentation that's going to take most of the rest of the decade. But my belief, there, what other, what else is there? At any rate, two cents worth. It's worth what you paid for. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <sighs> well, thanks, Andy. That was fun. Yeah. So let's force ourselves out of here in about five minutes.